that from Chewy? Uh, no. I think oh. I got it from Amazon. Oh, okay. One of my cats is like actively destroying one of the pillars on it though, so it's definitely gonna collapse soon. <laughs> the structural integrity is compromised. Yeah, it's extremely Woohoo! <laughs> it's live, it worked! Okay. I'm so surprised! Hey, I got a notification, cause I, you know, subscriber, so I, I know that you were live. Oh, She's that's so nice of you. That's so nice. <laughs> <laughs> Hi everybody, welcome to SciComm Happy Hour, yay! Today oh. I have a cup, but there's no alcohol in this cup yet because I have a lot of work to do today. But if you are drinking alcohol and joining us on this happy hour, welcome. Um, I am Trace. This is my channel. You probably have been here before, but if you haven't, welcome. I'm really happy that you're here. Um, I and Kishore Hari, who uh, is normally on the podcast, was a little busy today, um, decided when this whole self-quarantine stuff started that we would start talking to other science communicators because there's a bunch of people out there in the world. All of us really love uh, kind of engaging our minds and that's hard to do when you're by yourself. And so what better way to engage our minds together and also with you all than to meet once a week and do that. So here we are. <laughs> Welcome and let me kind of do a quick whip around and see who we got here. So uh, I'm Trace and Emily right below me in my screen is Emily Calandrelli. Hi, Emily. Hi, and this is Rose. <laughs> Rose. Hi, Hi Rose. Rose. <laughs> and uh, then we've also got Allie Caldwell. Hi, Allie. Hello. Hi, Allie. And then we've got Julian Huguet. Hi, Julian. That's, that's me. I feel like we're cheerleaders, like introducing ourselves. <laughs> <laughs> so why don't uh, why don't we go around and everybody tell everybody else a little bit about yourself, okay. in case they don't know. Emily, you want to go first? Yeah. Yeah. So uh, my name is Emily Calandrelli. On the interwebs, I'm known as the Space Gal. Um, my background is in like engineering stuff, aerospace engineering mostly, uh, hence the Space Gal. Uh, but today I'm mostly a science TV host, a children's book author, public presenter, um, that sort of thing. And uh, newly a mom. <laughs> she is like seven months old, so been getting used to that, and also quarantine life, uh, working and momming at the same time, which is very interesting to say the least. Uh, but yeah, that's a little bit about me. What about you, Allie? Uh, I'm Allie Caldwell. I am a neuroscientist turned institutional science writer. So I recently completed my PhD in neuroscience, focused on understanding how brain cells that aren't neurons influence how neurons grow. Um, but I uh, also have a YouTube channel like Trace. Uh, mine's all about the brain. My husband's a clinical therapist. I'm a neuroscientist, so we make videos about all kinds of topics on the brain. And I also work as a public information officer at UC San Diego Health. So it's been an interesting month. <laughs> yeah, you've been busy. <laughs> yes. And, and I think that's I'm everyone. So, oh, I'm sorry, Julian's <laughs> yeah, here too. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> what I thought. Um, I'm Julian Huguet. Uh, if you know Trace, I think there's a decent chance you know me because we worked together for quite a while back on old D News, uh, now Seeker, which is where I still am. I make uh, science educational videos there about four a month. And then I also do a lot of work in video games. I work for NVIDIA and their YouTube channel where I interview both software on and hardware developers about upcoming video game titles that are coming out. And then I, I play some of them too on my Twitch channel. Cool. Mm -hmm. Well, now that you know a little bit about us, how are, this is a terrible question, but it's what everybody asks all the time. How are you doing? I don't know how to answer that. I haven't come up with a good answer yet. Like, good? <laughs> Tentatively? I I'm exhausted. Yeah. I'm like, that. just constantly tired. Yeah. There's no we, amount of caffeine that helps. We were talking about, uh, with Kishore earlier, how we're all like kind of jet lagged in our own time zone, you know? Like mm -hmm. we all go to bed at three in the morning now, or that's what I'm doing. And no matter how hard I try, it's like, oh, I get up at one. And then I feel guilty about myself because of what society has told me is acceptable in the mm -hmm. past. It makes me feel bad now. But uh, yeah. if we collectively all feel that way, then I, I feel a little bit better. Yeah. I've been doing pretty well. I don't know. The last couple of days have been a little bit tough because I have a family member who lives in Wisconsin who 
is now sick after having to go out and vote last week because their ballot mm -hmm. didn't come in time. Mm. Um, and then another family member who just was furloughed. So that's a little tough, but um, my work from home situation is really nice. So I'm feeling really grateful for that. Um, like I said, my, my husband's a clinical therapist, so he has to have total privacy while he's working. So I've just like taken over our kitchen, which is where I'm sitting now, which is kind of a weird place to be, but it works. So, oh, and I got a standing, like a convertible standing desk last week, which helps a lot. <laughs> Ooh, that's a nice. I've got one of those. So like the top drops and you can have the wind in your hair or? No, it's like it goes up. Like I can, oh. it's kind of heavy, but I can pull it up. See? Oh, nice. Oh, okay. Yeah. That's fancy. So I can sit or stand. <laughs> That's cool. I find that I, stuff like that, those little things really do make a difference. When I first started working from home, I was um, in an office that had a, a desk that was like at a set height and I didn't get to pick that height. Like you couldn't adjust it. It was attached to the wall and like it was a little bit too low for me. And now that I live in this new apartment, I bought a desk that is like adjustable and it's so much better. I feel so much more, I don't know, at home, I guess, in my workspace. Those little like tweaks, I'm surprised how much it really affected me. I got super lucky because in late February, I decided I was gonna have more of a nice studio set up in my apartment and have like lights that make my face look decent and like just kind of arrange my desk in a way that would make streaming and live broadcasting look better and be easier. And then all of a sudden, all I have to do is shoot and work from home. And it's like, boy, that timing was, was fortunate. Yeah. Trace, Emily, you that, work like, like. Is that in your house or in your apartment? Like, are you filming uh, in your apartment? Yeah, that this looks is my. So nice. This is my my second bedroom that I turned into a studio. That, um, well right done, before all this friend. happened, <laughs> thank goodness, <laughs> I was like putting That's it all together for a month, and then all of a sudden they were like, "Okay, now you have to stay in it all the time." <laughs> I was like, "Okay." <laughs> oh my gosh. <laughs> Yeah, I the think... what if sign is from is from Vanessa Hill. It used to be hers, and she gave it to me. So this says what oh, if, awesome. but it, it's great. also like a nice orange and blue. But it only looks this way from the computer. From like the camera angle, you just see the wall, and the bookshelf. Yeah. So I don't know. This is actually kind of looks better. I feel yeah. like, but yeah. Yeah. it is yeah. what it is. Redesign your studio. Yeah. This is a good time for it, I guess. Although there, I've also read we're not supposed to say like, this is a good time to do those things we've been putting off because it can add a lot of stress to people who are already yeah, right. taxed. I, so. It's funny because I like we already didn't have a lot planned for this spring because we knew we were going to be writing a book. So we like we haven't had to cancel very much, which is nice. But it also means that like we feel like we don't have an excuse to not be making progress on our book. Yeah. <laughs> So it's definitely been interesting trying to do that too, like juggling real work and writing a book and also not losing my mind. Uh, recently, a friend taught me a trick that's been helping me where he said, because I, I kept getting in the habit of saying like, oh, I should do this, I should do that. And he told me, he's like, from the therapy that I've been in, uh, I learned that it is really helpful if instead you, you make those I want to statements so there's mm. not as much pressure on yourself mm. to do it and you don't feel as bad if you ultimately don't do it. It's just like, ah, I wanted to do it and I didn't. So I'm trying to replace a lot of things that I've been saying I should do with like, ah, I, I want to do this. I want to get through this backlog of work or I want to like I cut want together to do a reel or something. <laughs> yeah, I, no, I don't want to do that. I just did mine. They're great. I got my refund already. <laughs> Yay! Yay! Hey, refunds. So, okay, am I the only person drinking on this call then? No. Oh, I'll go. Let I'm gonna go grab. Good. I'm gonna go. Okay, good. Okay. Yeah, let me grab one. Hang on. Yeah, you guys, you guys take over. What are these boys doing? <laughs> Clearly, they haven't had hard enough days. I know. I was like, it's three o'clock on a Friday, and I had the day off. Like, I'm expecting this to be a happy hour because that's how it was marketed. That's how. Here I, I am. <laughs> this is what I've been told. Yeah, prepare. normally I would have like three drinks, but I wasn't prepared. Whew. Now I'm prepared. Cheers. Cheers. Thank you. Truly, you're a truly guy, huh? I don't know. Well, I don't know how I feel about that, Trace. What? Oh man, now you're learning things about me that you don't like. I don't like that at all. <laughs> white claw. White claw. I love a white claw. Keegan These like are not mine. They're Flavia's. Okay. I, I just, well, I just when drink you talk them. To Flavia, about it. You Flavia they don't like your truly choice. A really fun, no, not, well, 
I don't know about the flavors of Truly, just Truly in general. He requested I, this. What? That's not true. <laughs> we went through a whole like 12 pack and we doubled down and got 24. <laughs> wow. Trace. I spilled some Truly on the desk. Trace. I got excited. So something that's really fun to do is to do a blind taste test with White Claw, Truly, Happy Friday, La y'all. LaCroix, Happy Friday, Happy Friday. LaCroix, and just sparkling water, and like see if you can tell the difference because it is actually very difficult. Really? Yeah. Hmm. It, this sounds it, it like a fun game. If somebody, right as you take that sip, if somebody shouts the name of a fruit, then you think about that fruit flavor, and then you, you don't know. <laughs> The ghost mm. of the fruit. I, there yeah. was this really cool, back before D News existed, discoverynews.com was making videos. They'd been making them forever. I actually got started as an intern there. And what we had started doing was they would make these different correspondents would make videos. And long story short, they did one with Cargill flavor systems where they said essentially what you just said, Julian. They were like, they interviewed this guy whose whole job it was, was to create flavor and stuff. And so he gave the correspondent this little shot of chemical and he and she was like it tastes sort of like cotton candy like I'm not really sure how to place it and he's like yeah it doesn't really have the flavor that you think but when you pair it with the color red your brain interprets it as cherry see you think I was joking but all my jokes are science based <laughs> yeah it was really it was a really cool story I remember that from now gosh it's maybe 10 years ago that's neat. So one of the weirdest and like coolest stories we did for my show, um, the Exploration Outer Space show, was we went to the like main guy at NASA who was like the main sniffer at NASA, where he sniffed all of the things that are going to be brought to space to determine whether or not they were too pungent or um, there's like pungency, but there's also like likability, like if it was just very distasteful. Um, then he wouldn't yeah. allow it to go on station. Um, huh. And like on his, he uh, moonlighted as like a professional sniffer in other arenas. They would hire him for like stinky sock competitions and have him like determine who had the stinkiest socks. And there's just like all what? of these news articles in his lab of like him being a professional sniffer. And I was like, my dude, you have the most unique job I have ever seen. Uh, Emily, do you know if there's like something genetic or something that gave him a, a better sense of smell or? I, he, I mean, I know that he does have a better sense of smell than many other people because like there is a very scientific test that they take and they have to renew their like certification for this every few years their because smell your sense of smell, smell can like um, change over time. And so I did the test with him and there were like nine bottles in front of us with nine different uh, like flavors, I guess, or scents. And you had to match the bottle to the scent and you have to like get it perfectly right for you to be able to be a smeller for NASA. Whatever hmm. he has, I have the opposite because my wife thinks our apartment smells all the time and I'm like, seems fine to me. <laughs> oh, interesting. <lucky> her. <laughs> I know, right? Probably yeah. just my feet. I bet it's probably like being a sommelier, right? Like there's a degree, like there probably is some genetic component, but there's also gotta be a degree of like discrimination training. Yeah, you well, just can tell the difference between the different smells, like like colors. Yeah, I was just gonna say a long time ago, I did an episode about potentially people who can see more colors. And it's oh. like women who have had colorblind sons because one of their X chromosomes must be mutated to have like an additional cone shape like tetrachromat exactly so it's possible that they see like i think it's like a hundred times more colors like more degrees of, of hue than like the normal person can because of that fourth cone shape and so yeah. scientists have tested people and most of them there's not a difference but there's one woman in particular who's a, a painter and she seems to be able to differentiate hues much more accurately than normal people Hmm. I was I always liked the idea of kind of the opposite direction that 
you if you don't have a language for that color, it just doesn't exist to you, more or less. Yeah. So it's like the difference between chartreuse and like a lime green and then a green. If you don't have words for those different colors, you might just be like, oh, those are all green. It's just all the or, same. It's all just green or, or like all yellow. The color blue apparently is a more recent phenomenon, right? Yeah, radio lab. The Love that radio lab. Oh, well, oh. I've been saying stuff. If anybody else, Trace, do you want to explain it? <laughs> What? Emily didn't know what we were talking about. Yeah, what? Yeah, what? check it out. Oh, what do you mean? So, what does this mean? There's a great episode of Radio Lab where they talk about like how, of translations of this. And, and Julian and Ali, I don't know if you've listened to it, but correct me if I get it wrong. But it's essentially like in the simplest terms, we used to use a different color. We as in humans used to use a different color for certain things because we didn't have a word for it. So they referred to the ocean as purple or like the sky as purple. Because or something yeah. like we didn't have the color blue because blue is not a super common color in nature. So yeah. it wasn't like it was just the sky was the sky. It wasn't like the sky is a color. It was just like, no, that's just the sky. I read it was described as like copper colored by the ancient Greeks. Yeah. Because just blue is such an uncommon color in nature uh, that guess... when there's really not a lot of points of comparison, you're just like, eh, and it like it just appears different to them, apparently something like that. It was nuts. Yeah. So there's like there's a distinct point in literature and writing where you can see like the color blue start to emerging and being talked about more. But ancient Greeks like just didn't talk about the color blue. So they know. must have like yeah like in like their whatever their uh, dyes that they were using for clothes or whatever they just like didn't have the right ingredients to make that type well, of pigment. Famously, right in Renaissance paintings, the color blue is reserved for the Virgin Mary because it is the most rare color, the most valuable color. So you always see the Virgin Mary in blue because it was such an expensive pigment. Huh. So. This yeah. guy, he knows little things. Check that out when you see What were you going to say, Allie? Oh, I just wonder about other ancient cultures that maybe we don't have as much like written record of, but cultures that maybe lived in places where there was slightly more natural blue or like, mm -hmm. you know, like on the ocean and the sky. Yeah. I'm mm -hmm. curious. I mean, I think that the theory about language forming our cognitive thoughts, like our, our cognition is really, really interesting. Like all the, have you, have any of you like heard about any of the cultures where like, um, where all directions, like they don't have left or right. They only have like cardinal yeah. directions. Yeah. Yeah. Mm -hmm, yeah. Mm -hmm. Or like referring to time in different directions. Like relative like to where you are versus. Right. Yeah. Yeah. And how that really like impacts the way that you perceive time and and how you how you interact with and perceive your environment. And, like yeah. you yeah. know just like instinctively where north is. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Like that boggles my mind. I have <laughs> no understanding of how that is possible. I, every time somebody gives me directions and they're like, go north past the seven eleven, I'm like, what am I, Magellan? Like I don't know. <laughs> <laughs> That's funny. <laughs> that reminds me too of like the the I remember reading about it. I don't know how accurate it is, but that uh, pe the people who grew up learning in a, like a, a language that isn't based on like sentence structure. So like uh, like Japanese or Korean, where it's more like each of those characters has multiple, like has a very specific meaning. And so you have to just remember thousands of characters. You can't just take a bunch of words to make meaning. You have to have that character that means this thing. And then you end up having better memory recall task, like performance and stuff like that, because you're just remembering a lot more stuff in order to even function in your language, which, um, again, I don't know how accurate that is. I remember reading it years ago and thinking, that's yeah, really neat, and like, I should go and learn some like, language. Yeah. Whenever I talk like with an actual neuroscientist or somebody in, whose like, specialty is that field, I'm like, I've heard this, but I'll be <laughs> <laughs> Yeah, I mean, language is written into our brains, which I think is really cool. Like in in rural areas where there are populations of deaf people, like they invent their own sign languages that like adhere to all the rules of, of other languages. They have like grammatical rules and everything. They're just completely invented. Hmm. Um, uh, so if we can, this is a really good segue into the topic that I wanted to talk about this week, which is language in video games. Yes. I, you know what? I just want to give you a shout out for that segue because that was really good. <laughs> that was a great segue. Good segue. Good segue, everybody. Cheers. Um, <laughs> so like uh, much of the world, uh, Animal Crossing has been one of my main um, 
just distractions during all this, right? Like the timing was perfect because the game came out on March 21st and it's all like uh, based on actual time. In case people watching haven't played, don't know the game. I know Emily, you're, you're gonna get into it. Uh, so the game takes place on like a cute little deserted island. You're a, a normal human villager, but all the other townsfolk are different animals, anthropomorphized. And uh, it's also on like the actual day's clock. So, you know, 7 a.m. in the real world, 7 a.m. in the game. And uh, day by day, you know, you build up the town, you plant fruit trees, you build a house, you fill up a museum with fossils and fish and birds. You pay and, off uh, your debts and you, you end, end up getting no in debt more. So and then you pay off fantasy. your debts again. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. No, paying off a, a, a debt is definitely not the least realistic part of the game. But. <laughs> Um, the whole point of the game is like making you a part of this community and comfortable and just kind of relaxing. I describe it as like relaxation on crack because yeah. it's it's just so peaceful and serene. And I wasn't into the game. My wife loves this game. And she's been trying to get me to play past versions forever. And finally, I didn't have an excuse anymore. I'm home all day. Why not? So I start playing it. And I was laughing because I remarked on how all the little villagers don't speak, you know, English. They just speak this gibberish that kind of sounds like. <laughs> and I thought it was funny because localization is such an expensive part of a video game, you know, like uh, translating language and it's more specifically like idioms and like literal cultural things that that you have, but you may not be aware of. Localization teams have to nail that for like these big game releases. And I was like, well, that's so clever. If it's just gibberish, then it doesn't need to be localized. Right. And I was wrong because uh, as it turns out, being comfortable with the, even the gibberish you're hearing is kind of crucial to um, being comfortable in this game world. And I learned all this from a, a, an excellent video Polygon did. Specifically, the host was uh, Jenna Stober and she made a wonderful video that kind of traced the history of uh, how video games have tackled handling human speech. And it starts with like, okay, we our voice synthesizers aren't very good or our audio recordings suck. This is back in like, you know, the 80s, 90s. And so instead we can just have like text appearing on screen and little beeps accompanying it. And if that happens, you kind of process it more like it's being spoken to you than like you're just reading things and it's an information dump. And then they started having, you know, human voices recorded, but chopped up into gibberish. Like the Sims had actual human voices improvising uh, gibberish. <laughs> <laughs> so yeah. yeah, which is so funny because uh, as as uh, Stober pointed out that like they're using humans to now mimic the gibberish that past games have had to avoid using human voices. And then uh, with Animal Crossing, when it first released, it was only supposed to be in Japan. It was a game called Dubutsu no Mori, and the intention was never to give it an international release. So it has a lot of Japanese-specific things, like the way the post office looks, the way the fountain in the town square looked. And then when people who played uh, the game who were part of Nintendo Treehouse, which was like their American you know, office, they were like, you have to bring this game to the States. You have to translate it. And so the uh, gibberish in the game in the original was based on kind of like voice synthesizing Japanese and then speeding it up. And then you had to localize it for these these different regions. And then in the next couple releases, they just were like, you know what, we'll make it kind of vague and generalized. And they, they had a different language they called BBB, where it's just more like BBB, 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 BBB. And um, that might not be entirely the reason, but the games that used BBBs weren't as well received. And so for the latest game, Animal Crossing New Horizons, it's got kind of a mix of BBBs and some, some language specific uh, gibberish. And the concept that this video talks about is uh, prosody. And prosody is the linguistic concept of like speech patterns like intonation and rhythm and how important it is if you speak a specific language, even if you're hearing gibberish, like you'll identify it more as your own language if it follows the speech patterns and rhythm of your own language. So Animal Crossing New Horizons is localized 
uh, partially because you need to feel comfortable in this world and hearing gibberish that you still recognize as being in your native sounds and rhythm is important to making you feel comfortable. So I learned that Animal Crossing New Horizons language is still localized, even though I thought it didn't happen. So cool. I thought it was that fascinating. Is cool. That is cool. When you told me that, that I was like, you have to come on the stream and talk about why. It's the only way. I was that begging is so him and he cool. was like, no, you're not interesting enough. <laughs> oh, so I went, is that, do you think that's like harder than just doing speech? Like having someone voice over in that particular language? Um, I don't think so because they still use a voice synthesizer to mm -hmm. um, kind of say some of the, the sounds. Like you can hear that a lot of repeated sounds like I or you or whatever sound kind of like it in English. And then it's just sped up. Okay. So you can't hear that the voice synthesizer kind of sucks at making those sounds, but it's still familiar enough when it's sped up in gibberish. But definitely like having a, a, a new cast of voice actors people is way more work still. Yeah. That's interesting. I've so I've been playing Animal Crossing now since the first one came out on the GameCube in the US. I really loved it. I played it a lot in college, like two thousand and two. <laughs> and like we um my friends and I all had like houses in this town and stuff, but we tried to figure out the voice stuff because it seemed to me like even then and now in the new game as well, when you're typing on the keyboard, it tells you what letter you just typed. So it's like K, L, A, mm -hmm. V, kind of like it just says that letter. So I always just assumed that they took those sounds and smushed them into the word. So if the word yeah. was like, you know, I don't know, coyote, it would just say all of the letters really fast. Coyote. Um, so it'd be like, get it. And so it would sound like, but it wasn't actually right. So maybe that's part of how it was built. I mean, yeah. that's in my head. That's what, what I hear when I play the game. But like, I just think it's cool. And that would also fit with localization, right? You'd have the alphabet of whatever local area you were using. So you just need to program the alphabet into it. And then it would pull those variables and play them. Yeah, it's true. It's a good point. It would simplify the localization. I have but I don't know. I've, when I've been playing, I have listened, like sometimes listening, you can hear words when you listen to them talk, especially yeah. Blathers. I mean, you can definitely hear when he says who, <laughs> you know? Um, but, or coelacanth. No, yeah. Okay. yeah. Have you, have any of you watched any of the videos or like listen to any of, any audio of people have like recorded English? It sounds like English, but it isn't English, but it has like the same oh, yeah. speech patterns. Yes. Like, yes. it's like a couple having an argument, but all right. their words are totally random. Yes. A and they were like, this is what English sounds like to a non-English speaker. Yeah. Like, I love I, those That's kind of what I think of when I think of the Animal Crossing language. Mm. Yeah. yeah. It makes sense. The The way the video put it the um, that I watched was that like, because of prosody, like when you hear somebody through a wall, even though you can't hear the words, you can still know what language they're speaking. Mm. You know, mm, that's cool. Yeah. I, I had a friend, this is a slightly different topic, still about Animal Crossing. I had a friend Perfect. send me a video today um, where somebody was analyzing um, the setting of Animal Crossing and making an argument for the way Animal Crossing, like the world is designed, actually mimics 18th century villages where essentially like village debt was a huge part of the lifestyle and the idea mm. was that like having this debt it wasn't truly debt because it didn't matter that much if you paid it back but by having the debt it essentially had you tied to that village yeah like you'd be together and it, right and it encouraged you to stay and so the same it was like the same kind of idea of like as soon as you paid off your debt they would then like build something more for you to make you have more debt so that you would stay um, which I thought was also a really interesting, uh, I mean, I don't know how accurate it is, but I thought it was a really interesting kind of parallel. I mean, it sounds that like what cool. happens in the game. Yeah. Yeah. It like makes me want to play the game, not because I care about paying off my debt, but I'm like, well, at some point I'm going to want a bigger house. And the only way to do that, pay off that debt to old Tom Nook. Yeah. <laughs> so you don't make money in the game you just pay off the debt and they give you oh, a man. gift okay. I wow. mean you can make money <laughs> you can especially if you play the stock market which is yeah. what they call when you buy There's and sell turnip stock stocks stock market? Yeah. not stock with, a, like not a with a, an O S-T-A-L-K 
stock. You buy turnips stocks. on Sundays, Absolutely. and then you can sell them throughout the week, and the price changes. And different towns, actually, now that there's an online component to the game, so this has been around for a long time in the game, <laughs> but now that there's an online component, it's crazy, and like somebody will have, so you buy it for 100 bells is the in-game currency, and then you might be able to sell it for like 400 bells or 600 bells in someone else's town. So you have yeah. to like find people who have it at a high price. But if, if you find those people and they happen to put their code amongst a friend group, mm -hmm. uh, their town can be inundated. There are a bunch of stories of people who like open their towns to strangers and then nobody can play because the game is like constantly having people come in and out and it, it, it has to pause and save every time somebody either comes in or leaves. <laughs> and it's yeah. like a huge, crazy mess. There are people really making funny. like Google spreadsheets of like all that, like Discord Getting groups, in line to and go. And they tell yeah. you like, yeah, because the price changes twice a day. So they'll tell you like, here's my price in my town now. And then like when somebody gets a really good price, everybody goes to their town and sells. And you can make millions of in-game bells. But that comes back to what we were talking about right before the stream. And Ali was saying, and I agree with you 100%. And that is that we don't love that it's competitive all the time. <laughs> yeah. Well, and I think I read an article about this the other day that I thought, like, it, it made me feel a little bit better because it essentially was making the argument about how, you know, if this game had been released under totally different circumstances, it probably would have been the way that the other Animal Crossing games have been in the past, which is really just kind of embracing this, like, slow, real-time gameplay where you... So, so essentially in the game, you move to this desert island, you get this house, from Tom Nook, he gives you this loan that you eventually have to pay off, but it's zero interest and you pay it off at your leisure. And then you can go around and you can collect fruit from your trees and you can grow and plant flowers and you can collect fish from the ocean and the rivers. And the idea is that eventually, you know, like you build stuff that you can decorate your house with and you can sell stuff and you can give stuff to other people who live on your island. You can go visit other islands. And so normally the game is intended to be just this kind of like, like you basically do chores for fun. Like that's kind of what the game is like. And yeah. what sort of happened is because there are so many people now who are playing the game and who are spending so much time online who are just kind of sitting at home. I've been inundated with all of these. And it's, I don't think it's even like in most cases, it's not even people trying to be competitive about it, but it's people being like, look at how cute my house is. And look at all the cool stuff I have in my Animal Crossing house. And look at all my great outfits and look at all this great stuff. And it's like, it's hard because I also want cool stuff, but I don't want to grind. Like I don't want the game to just be grinding, collecting things well, all the time. You know what I see as somebody who works in video game is I don't, think they anticipated that everybody would be at home playing this game all right. day because yeah. there there's like an event that just happened right leading up to easter they had an in-game bunny day event and uh oh. the idea was like oh i know you roll your eyes <laughs> right. you can see the look on her face you can see it the, coming. yeah the horror right because like this event lasted for 12 days and the idea was like oh there'll be little easter eggs and, and maybe you'll check in little... like every yeah, few days you know, you think you're fishing and you're gonna catch another goddamn egg. <laughs> so uh, people were getting so frustrated because it was just like egg after egg after egg. And I, I, by the time the event was over, I had hundreds that I didn't need because you can make stuff with them, but I had already made everything. So um, you can tell that their expectation was like, you know, people would have three COVID-19 lives. And so, you know, you go about your day and then you get home and maybe you play for a couple hours and you get a few eggs and you're like, sweet, I have just enough now to build all this stuff. Like the game design choices were clearly like a pre COVID-19 world. And because we're after it now, or we're in it now, like you can tell there's a lot of things that they just like thought weren't, we weren't gonna be playing all day. So they didn't account for it. Like I keep getting the same furniture over and over. I have all the furniture and there's nothing new because it was gonna be released more slowly. And, yeah. and it's too late, I've gotten everything. So there's no winning, right? There's no winning. No. There's also no okay. losing. There's also yeah. there's no also losing. no losing. It's like I, it's like has, hiking. You can't win. Has a anyone hike. seen the show Mythic Quest? No, not yet. The Apple Plus one about a game development studio. <laughs> yes, I have too many streaming it's services. So good. It's so. Is it good? So I, okay. Good. Well, since you gave it a review, I'll have to check it out. Yeah. You Mythic absolutely Quest. have to. And I was gonna make an analogy, but for anyone who might be watching who has seen Mythic Quest. 
Um, there is one episode that's like a standalone episode that features Nick from New Girl and then the woman from How I Met Your Mother, who is like the eventual mother. Mm -hmm. um, so Spoilers. they had this like standalone, and no, 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 no. <laughs> <laughs> that show is long gone. Yeah. <laughs> I was just going around to season seven. <laughs> um, well, then you, I'm glad you haven't seen Mythic Quest then. It's, it's okay. all spoiled. Okay, um, good. So they have the standalone episode where they like develop this new game where it's like this innovative game where there's no winning, but it's called something like Dark Black Death or like Dark Night Death or something, or, or S S Dark Silent Death, I think. And it's like, there's no winning. There's only like constantly pushing the monsters away. It's like life. And it's supposed to be like really <laughs> dark, dreary uh, emo game. And this feels like the, the counter yeah. to that. Yeah. <laughs> it's like happy and fluffy and wonderful, but there's still no winning and losing. <laughs> That, the yeah. one you described sounds like Dark Souls. Did you ever play Dark Souls? Dark Souls is legendarily hard because there's like no tutorial. The monsters are insanely difficult and like one hit and they kill you. And like even if you clear a whole area, like when you revive, you have to kill them all again. So like it sounds a lot like the the Dark Souls games that you that that I've played before. Right before Shelter in Place happened, I downloaded a game called The Longing on Steam. Have any of you heard of it? Mm -mm. No. It's um it's an idle game, so it similar to Animal Crossing, it's actually in real time, so it continues going in the background even when you're not logged into the game. Right. But it's actually a really perfect game for right now because in the game you you are a shade, you play a shade who lives in an underground cave, and your king has gone to sleep for 400 days. And you have to wait for 400 real-time days for your king to wake up. And Whoa. in the meantime, you can do things like you can wander around and explore the caves, and you can collect things like rocks and moss and paper, and you can make drawings and read books. And they literally have like the entire te like the entire text of Moby Dick in the game. Like you could wow. actually read all of Moby Dick in game if you wanted. Oh, that's good because I lost my library card, and I was wondering how <laughs> I was going to read it. <laughs> So that um, one's, and you also, you move very, very slowly. So like your character just like kind of plods around the caves and yeah. it's kind of soothing. <laughs> Have huh. you ever heard of the Stanley Parable? Yes. It's one of my favorite games. It's very bizarre. It's totally fourth wall breaking game. And the game is like, takes place in like an office building and you can't interact with much. And you walk around and there's this very dry British narrator explaining what you're doing the whole time. Mm -hmm. And then at one point, you come to a fork in the office building where there's two doors. And the narrator goes, coming to two doors, Stanley picked the door on his left. And then you can go right. And the narrator starts arguing with you. of like He's like, that's not what I said you should do. And then <laughs> it goes really off the rails. And it gets very, very strange. And you can tell the people making it had a weird sense of humor. Because you know in-game achievements are normally like, kill 500 monsters or whatever. <laughs> there's a Stanley Parable achievement that's go five years without playing the Stanley Parable. <laughs> so like, like one day, five years after you've played it, you'll just get a little notification like, congrats on your achievement for not playing this <laughs> for five years. <laughs> That's great. Yeah. Well, Emily, I think you should play Animal Crossing and I think you should visit all of our islands because it, that is really fun. And I actually, to kind of echo Allie's point like that I teed her up for, like we don't want the competition part. Um, and there are things that you can do in Animal Crossing that are crappy. And you were looking for tips earlier. So I think if everybody, mm -hmm. I think let's go around and everybody give Emily one rose and one thorn for Animal Crossing. I think my rose for Animal Crossing, like my pro tip is um, there are so many things to do in the game that in this chat, we could talk about it for the next 20, 30, 40 minutes and still not explain <laughs> everything that you can do. Um, but it it is kind of like a vacation. So try not to, for me, the thing that I find enjoyable is to not take it too seriously. It's just like run around, shake some trees, hit rocks with shovels, like catch some fish, just relax and run around. Cause it's like, it's a little bit of an escapism. And then something that you shouldn't probably do is break the rocks with the shovels. Um, they do re, they come back, but like you don't really get much for breaking them. So only break them if you need to, if it's like in the way. You want to move it, and it'll randomly show up somewhere else in your town. You might accidentally break one, one once in a while, and that's totally fine. It's going to come back in a couple days, but it's like, 
and when it first started getting popular, everybody was like breaking their rocks every day, and they're like, "What?" But now I don't have any rocks, and it's like you get money from rocks. It's weird, oh, but yeah. you do. So it's like kind of valuable to not to have them around. You get uh, like they get produce one rocks produce money, rock. money sometimes, yeah. So you yeah. hit rocks every so day with your shovel. They don't grow on trees, but they grow on rocks. They you also grow on trees. Also grow on trees. <laughs> yeah, grow on trees. Okay. Every so here's here's like, uh, here's a pro tip. The money rock, you get one money rock a day, and every time you hit that rock, within a limited amount of time, once you start hitting it, the money that comes out doubles. And the final one that comes out is 8,000 bells. So dig a couple holes behind you, because every time you hit it, your character gets knocked back a little bit, but they won't get knocked back into the holes. So just, yeah, dig a couple holes behind you, and then hit, 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 hit. Pro tip yeah. number two, once you get access to a fence, just build little corner fences by all your rocks. That. That's what I do. Yeah. So every one of my rocks has a little corner fence. So I'll just like go in the corner and hit my rock a bunch of times. Similarly, uh, shaking the trees that don't have fruit on them, uh, you can get one piece of furniture per day that falls out of a tree. Uh, but there's also wasps that live in trees. So have your net out when you're shaking trees. Yeah. If you shake the tree from the front, um, yeah. if you shake the tree from the front every time, You'll, if a wasp falls, you'll turn toward it and go, ah, and then you can grab it if you have your net equipped. Yeah. Otherwise, that you can pass out and you'll wake up at your house. But you can't die. Say, as someone who's never played Animal Crossing, <laughs> this conversation sounds ridiculous. <laughs> like, it is. It is. Lovely, like ridiculous in a very lovely, joyful way, but like absolutely ridiculous <laughs> <laughs> what about you Allie? Give, let's let's share another pro tip i mean my i think my pro tip would just be do do what you enjoy doing in the game like when you find things that you like to do then keep doing those things and like i have i have thought about muting the animal crossing hashtag on twitter except that i do have like friends that i eventually want to play with um, but just like, yeah, don't, don't get caught up in the, like, and again, I don't think it's always intended to be competitive, but just like, don't compare how your progress is going compared to other people. Mm -hmm. Um, that's my pro tip. And then I think yeah. the thorn for me is just like, I, as, so my favorite video game of all time is Zelda Breath of the Wild. And my biggest frustration with Animal Crossing is that you have very little control over your perspective. Mm -hmm. So in terms of like interacting with things in the world, like I'm constantly digging holes in the wrong spot or hitting the wrong thing, or I can't see something I'm trying to pick up. And so like, that's the thorn I, I give to the game. And really, I mean, for me, it's just like another exercise and like trying to relax to just be like, okay, like I can't see it and it's not that big of a deal and it's going to be fine. Mm -hmm. <laughs> yeah. Allie, have you unlocked the terraforming tools yet? Like the water and the cliff tools? I have, and the the placement of them is so imprecise that I like have an aneurysm every time I'm trying to like change the landscape of my town. Yeah, <laughs> and I keep building cliffs in the wrong place. I know. Bastard it's game. It's just it's really it's difficult to see where you are doing things, and then also once you build stuff, like it costs money to build stuff in the game. So when you put something somewhere, and if you put it in the wrong spot, now you have to pay a bunch of money to like. Adjust move it, it a again. little bit like one square or whatever right so yeah i would just yeah. say like don't don't sweat it too much okay but i have a question um i'm looking for roses and oranges so if anybody has this on their islands please let me know i you can come, you can come to my island after the stream i've got all the fruit and we've got and roses were the flowers that we started with so we, oh, we almost nice. always have rose seeds okay. nice cool nice yeah um i actually since Ali, since you're you were chit chatting, I thought maybe I'd ask how things are where you're located. And you put in our little doc that you wanted to you're moving cross country right now. And so speaking of like little frustrations, how's that going? <laughs> yeah, I mean it's it's just it's a weird time. So I I currently live in the San Diego area. Uh, I've lived here for seven years. Um, it was never intended to be a permanent place for us my husband and I are both from the Midwest so we're moving we're planning a move to Chicago this summer which is really exciting but it's also a really challenging time to be doing that uh, I mean I had to accept this job offer sight unseen I never I've never met any of the people that I'll be working with in person 
and uh, now it looks like we're probably going to have to sign a lease sight unseen. So it's, wow. I think the, the biggest bummer, and I've, I've come to terms with it by now, but last week was really hard for me because the biggest disappointment was just realizing that this is what the last couple months of our time in San Diego is going to look like, mm. that we're just going to be stuck in our house and not get to spend time with our friends or go to all the places that we've enjoyed. Um, I have been going out and trying to ride my bike every day, which is really helpful. All the beaches are closed, but I can at least bike to places where I can see the beach. So that's nice. Mm -hmm. um, but yeah, that's definitely kind of been the, the big challenge. And like, I mean, I'm like, I am an anxious person in general. So like, I just want to find an apartment in Chicago as fast as possible. But then that comes with its own whole load of like stressors and anxieties. And I've never lived in a big city like that as an adult. So I have no idea like how different it is from finding housing in a city like San Diego. Mm -hmm. So, man. <laughs> Well, I put a call in the chat. If anybody wants to provide some advice, well, hopefully somebody will, will give you a little shout out, some one of our viewers. But I've, I think, I think you're going to do great. Like, I think Chicago is a great town, yeah. and like the people are pretty chill. It's still the Midwest. It's like yeah. it, it there's still like that level of Midwestern niceness. It's still like a big city, so people are a little more brusque, but they're also like, oh, I'm sorry, <laughs> I'm not, I can't talk to you right now. <laughs> yeah. You know, sorry, so that's sorry, nice. Yeah, yeah. yeah. Um, but it's that's exciting and also scary. Like, I think those are the kind of things that we don't really see as much during this pandemic situation is like we hear a lot about people in hospitals, which we should. We hear a lot about like people on the front lines and grocery stores, which we should, you know, and like food service and all of these other places. And but like you don't hear about people that are I accepted a job. You know, the people who lived in the apartment below us bought a house right as this wow. was all starting. And now no one has moved in, of course, but they were paying. They were leaving early at a place where it's like fills new apartments pretty regularly. And they had to pay the rest of the month because no one is going to move in like right. They had to yeah. pay out their lease because no one's yeah. going to move in and take it over. And well, it's just like those kind of stories are crazy. You had to postpone your wedding, right? Like, what's that yeah. like? I did. Yeah, we had to postpone our wedding. It was going to be um, in a we would actually be leaving for Brazil in about 12 days. Um, yeah. We're not doing that. We're going to have it in the fall instead, uh, which is unfortunate. But like our vendors understand. And I think that's the nice thing um, and something that maybe you can take some solace in, Allie. Is it like everyone is in the situation together at least like nobody's there are very few people that are like this isn't real this is like not happening you know yeah. every country in the world more or less is affected every oh, yeah. person feels at least in some way feels this so it's like the brazilian vendors that we had it's just like they either had something already booked for that weekend or the, the new weekend or but all of them were like oh no we we're open, please, like, let us know. Yeah. And even the hotel, which only does a few weddings a year, like 10 a year, um, and all in May, we're like, <laughs> no, you can do it in October. That's fine. You can do it in <laughs> August. What do you need? Like, so everybody's yeah. been very accommodating and helpful. Yeah. Mm -hmm. No, yeah. We've been, I mean, we've been super lucky. Like, I, I you know, I, I recently defended my PhD. I have so many friends who are now, like, and that's like a huge thing, right? Like it's, yeah. it's one of the days yeah. I remember for the rest of my life. And now I have so many friends who are defending via Zoom, which is still great. They get to do that, but it's a totally different experience. Like I, I, I have felt really bad for people who have had to cancel events like weddings and who are not able to celebrate their defense with people. Wow. I had a friend that studies, literally she studies like the spread of viruses and she was defending her PhD a couple weeks ago and had to defend it over zoom and i was like this is like clearly like a very very yeah. sad thing but also just peak irony yeah. yeah 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 my wife and i had our wedding on leap day on february 29th so we got it in the nick of time wow. and it was wow. it's literally the day of the first covid19 uh fatality in the united states so wow. oh boy we cut it close i had a friend who was supposed to defend this month and get married this month Woof. They did yeah. defend, but the wedding is being postponed. Yeah. I I get my heart goes out because I'm sure Trace that's just like so much anxiety because you have so planning a wedding in general is just like the most 
anxiety ridden thing I've ever done in my life. And to have that on top of it is just like so much more than you should be dealing with. And then there's like the bachelor party and the bachelorette party and like all these things that you have expectations for that you have to just like put everybody's life on hold. We hear about like the the awful stuff that's happening uh, clearly. And like, as you said, like as we should, but there's all this other stuff that coronavirus is stealing from people like these first moments that you've always thought about your whole life or like mm -hmm. the first hellos to babies and yeah. like last goodbyes for families like it's stealing so much yeah, yeah. and like prom um, for people in high school yeah. and yeah. high school graduation yeah, if something had saved me from prom i think i'd actually be grateful <laughs> <laughs> um, that's funny so uh, on a more upbeat story trace was at my wedding and um, I was yeah and Trace is responsible for one of my favorite memories from my wedding so we did a very small wedding we did it like on the beach on the cheap and then we just went to a restaurant afterwards you know and uh, coincidentally my wife and I had to move the same month as our wedding so that wow. was fun but um, we had like a total of 30 people and we assembled this wedding arch like on the beach minutes before the ceremony happened you know we were like screwing and stapling and like <laughs> decorating you know it was real real uh real ad hoc and then um after we built it we were like what do we do with it like it's all screwed together there it is right <laughs> so we didn't know how to get rid of it so trace drags this thing to a nearby alleyway and then makes a craigslist posting for a wedding arch only used once <laughs> and like the picture of it and within an hour, he had four responses of people like, I'll take it. Did like, somebody come and get it? Problem solved. Yeah, somebody picked it up. Nice. I was like, that's clutch thinking. Yeah. Of course people will want free stuff. Yeah. It was nice. pretty fun. It was so funny. Oh, it was one of my favorite moments. I still have that picture. I also moved the same month that I got married. Oh. <laughs> it was it was really fun. The only thing was like we had all of our wedding gifts, but we just put them all in their boxes in the moving truck. So we didn't open them until we like got to our new house, which was like kind of great, but also yeah. I know disappointed my mother-in-law cuz we didn't open enough presents in person. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, we moved cool, right huh? before uh because we'd heard a lot of stories of people who were moving around the time of their wedding and gifts were going different places and there was all the like extra boxes to deal with so we moved earlier and tried to plan ahead and then it turned out we could have just hung out for a while <laughs> <laughs> but you know i'm happy we did and now actually there is a lot of anxiety in like just generalized kind of stress about planning a wedding but how we're trying to tell ourselves to deal with it is is like it's now six months away. It was five weeks away when we postponed it and we were like trying to finish everything up and had a lot to do. And now it's like, well, now we've got the same to-do list pretty much, but it's <laughs> six months instead. So that's kind of nice. nice. Um, Extension. Fun story about that too is I'm, I'm saying this as a joke. I think our wedding might be cursed a little bit. So not only did we have to postpone it, um, but Flavia got a phone call just recently and she was like, Hey, what's going on? Because it was the people, the store where she bought her wedding dress in San Francisco. And uh, she had driven up to San Francisco because she couldn't fly because it was pandemic and it had just started to come in. And when she drove up there, she was going to like try on the dress and she'd fully like had a plan of, okay, I'm going to drive up. I'm going to try it on. I might put it back in the car, even though like if it fits, we're taking it so that I don't have to come back again and get it altered again. And who knows how long it's going to take because we still thought we were getting married in May. And then, and while she was there, San Francisco went under lockdown. Um, and she was like, do I stay? Do I leave? I guess I should leave. So she drove all the way back right after her appointment um, and then got a call this week. And they were like, hi, um, so we got broken into and they stole your dress. No. <laughs> no. Um, no. Yeah. Yeah. So what? There's apparently what a, a black weird... market dress, wedding dress market. I don't yeah, know. I guess. Uh, but anyway, they're gonna replace it, and like it's it, it, oh. the there was still she will still have a dress, and it'll be you know whatever. But it's just we couldn't help but laugh at that point. It's just like there's all these things happening, and it's like that you know if the wedding had been in ten days. Yeah. <laughs> Yeah. That could have been crazy. <laughs> so it's like this is there might be a 
there's a, a reason to laugh sometimes, I guess. I don't know. Yeah. Well, and speaking yeah. of laughing, medium, medium okay segue. I want Emily to talk about all her facial expressions that she makes. Do you make those on purpose on your science things? If you I don't, don't know. Uh, I'm gen I am like genuinely terrified of some of the things that I do. And I think just like my scared faces, that's just the way it looks. That's Emily's I, been that's doing sciencey stuff on her Instagram um, and on your, her YouTube channel and just like putting out their science experiments for everyone. And I think it's just the best. It's so fun. And they're so they're so great because they're all so simple and like not that the experiments are simple, but it's like, here's yeah. one thing. Do this one thing and you got it. And it's really cool. The goal was definitely to find like an experiment that I could learn about do with stuff that I had in my house and film an entire YouTube about it, YouTube video about it. Don't I sound like such a cool kid? Film a YouTube about it, <laughs> um, <laughs> like within 12 hours. And so like I, in the last four weeks, I've uploaded 20 different uh, experiments and I've done them like each in one day. So they all have to like fit that little box of like something that's like relatively simple, but kind of interesting and something that you can do while like not having to necessarily like run out to the store to get something unique um and like i was talking about how good your background looks i've literally been doing all of my experiments like in my living room behind my coffee table and i don't even have like a decent tripod so i set it up on a chair because my hair is like only a certain height i have to like sit down on the floor and like position my body in such a way that like everything fits in the camera view <laughs> i don't use a mic i don't have like i have like one light that i use and that's it it's like bare bone stuff and it takes for me it feels like it takes like so long which is part of the reason why i'm so tired because i'm just like like staying up to like midnight every night working on these midnight for me is late i like generally like, <laughs> <doing> that, like <laughs> 10 and because the baby wakes me up at like 6 30. but uh trace and like e like ali and uh, julian i'm sure like you guys are all very professional youtubers my hat <laughs> tips off to everybody who actually puts so much work into these because i'm putting like the bare bare minimum and it takes so much time i got a text from my friend who's a teacher the other day saying he had to like do lessons from home and he's like I don't know how you make videos all the time it's the worst and I'm like <laughs> I don't do most of the work I just show up usually uh, um Emily of the experiments that you've done what has ha been like the most surprising to you or what's been your favorite the one where okay so I did DIY ice cream which is like something I did when I was little it's basically you mix all the ingredients for ice cream like milk and half and half and vanilla mm -hmm. and sugar in a bag and then you put it in a bag of ice and then you add salt to it and you massage it for five minutes and voila, you have ice cream. Mm. And I did it as a kid and I didn't really understand what was happening. And I still didn't like quite, like I thought that you added ice to salt or salt to ice to just make it melt. And I was like, oh, you're making it melt. You're covering more of the surface area of the bag. So it's like really making sure that the bag gets cold, but like ice, lowers the freezing point or salt lowers the freezing point of ice which is why we put salt on our roads in the winter so that like on a 30 degree day or a 20 degree day um if you have water on your roads you can put salt on them it lowers the freezing temperature to say like 15 degrees if you put it more and you have like a ton of salt you can get it down to like two degrees fahrenheit like negative 16 degrees celsius um and so it won't freeze until it gets that cold and so that's why we put it on uh roads in the winter time but like it also, if you just have a cup of ice um, and you leave it out for five minutes and you take its temperature, it'll be like 33 degrees, 34 degrees Fahrenheit, just like a little bit above freezing temperature. Makes sense. But if you have a cup of ice and add salt to it and leave it out for five minutes, it will get down to like 14 degrees Fahrenheit. Like it literally, not only it lowers the, does it lower the freezing point, it like lowers the entire temperature of the system because when ice melts, the bonds between the water molecules, it takes energy to break them. And to, the, the way that it gets that energy is by sucking heat out of its environment. It like takes heat from its environment to use that energy to break the bonds. And so it makes the entire environment cooler. And like, I didn't realize that that was the way it worked and I didn't have any thermometers at my house. And so the next grocery trip I took, I got these thermometers and I did the test and I was like, what? <laughs> <laughs> works? Like I had no idea. And it was like this experiment I've been doing since I was little. So that one blew my mind. But like, and then, in 
as a bonus when you're done, you have ice cream. And then you have ice cream. And like, it's actually win, delicious. win. It's such a win. But like these experiments have been really fun because I'm going back to the basics of engineering and like learning these concepts that I like very vaguely remember learning. But I like I the other day I did one um, with a copper wire and a magnet and a battery where when you have an electric current moving through a magnetic field, it creates a force called the Lorenz force. And I was like, I vaguely remember that name. And isn't the right hand rule something that's related to that? And like the right hand rule is something it, it's a, you can use it for many different things in physics, I believe. But like one of them is like determining which way the force is going to go. And so I was like, okay, the current is moving down this way. And then the magnetic field is probably pointed this way. So the force should be this way. And then it spun this way. And I was like, I could predict that. <laughs> that. So this has uh, been a nice thing to fill my time. If you really like watching Emily just explain what she's doing, the videos are even better. <laughs> it's really great. It's really cool. I'm really happy that you're doing it. I know that you like Emily mostly does TV stuff. So it's always fun to have have Emily in the digital world because she's like, I don't know, one of my faves for that stuff. Oh, you're one of my faves. Also, I wanted I saw like little snippets of it. Can I see the tattoo? I feel like I haven't seen it. In yeah, sure. Time. I haven't made my video on it yet. Um, so you I was haven't? covering it up for a long time. But yeah, it oh, goes wow. all the way to here. That's cool. So yeah. cool. I love That's that. Great. It oh, looks really good. It's actually um, I don't know how detailed you can really see it. But uh, this oh, is yeah. actually a freckle. <laughs> but it, whatever the biggest moon of Jupiter, I guess Ganymede or something. I don't know. Poor, what are the biggest moon of Jupiter? Is in your armpit. No, just, yeah. Poor little yeah, Uranus no, is oh, Uranus is Pluto here. There? Oh, you have Uranus there. Okay. And then there's no Pluto Neptune. because I didn't want to add all the dwarf planets. But if we ever, you know, make them full planets, I'll add them on. <laughs> but I have a whole side. video planned. Um, without spoiling too much, I'm essentially going to, there's a lot of videos about scale of the universe and they usually don't talk about the universe. They just talk about our solar system. And since this is to scale, I thought it'd be cool to talk about like other things in the universe and how far they would be if this is our solar, solar system. system. Yeah. So I have a whole map planned, but I can't do it until we can go outside. <laughs> <laughs> so I was like, I was actually texting with Julian and I was like, okay, we're going to do this. And he's like, yeah, this is going to be really fun. And I'm like, okay, this is going to be great. And then they were like, you can't go outside. And we were like, <laughs> no. Cool. Cool. <laughs> I'll just keep making videos in my house. Nice. So that's what I'm doing. <laughs> but with that, actually, we're, we're, it's been an hour. We just wasted a perfectly good hour, everybody. Good job. I mean, like 30 minutes of that was Animal Crossing. It's true. 30 minutes was Animal Crossing. <laughs> and it could have been more. It could I been. apologize for nothing. Yeah. Oh, <laughs> no, no apology needed. I feel no, very well prepared for this weekend. Yeah, you're ready. Good. If you need any help, you know, you know who to text. You can just okay. send us messages. We'll, how does we'll... how do you visit an island? Do you just like put in somebody's name <sighs> Man. or something? Okay. There's like can... three different ways. It's complicated. <laughs> you guys are like, We're going to talk okay. about that offline. We're going to talk about that after the stream. But okay. uh, why, Emily, why don't you tell people where they can find your experiments and then we'll work our way, our way around. So my, I don't know how people share their YouTube channel, but like, I've just been saying I'm at youtube.com slash space gal. Uh, that's like my YouTube. Okay. Yep. And then everywhere else I'm uh, at the space gal on Instagram, Twitter, and Facebook. Allie. Uh, you can find me uh, on YouTube at youtube.com slash neurotransmissions. Uh, we just put out a video about with some tips on handling social isolation and uh, COVID-19 shelter in place. So if you're looking for tips on kind of keeping your mental health good during this time, definitely check it out. And I'm working on a video about what we know about COVID-19 in the brain. So if you want to hear about the neuroscience of it, check that out in a couple weeks. Um, you can also find me on Twitter at Ali underscore astrocyte. Um, and I have a book coming out this December. So look for that too. Yay! Wait, what's the book called? Uh, we don't have an official title yet, and I'm also not positive it's going to come out in December. But it's That's with Weldon name. Owen, and it's going to be mm -hmm. um, probably the Big Brain Book is what we've been talking about. All kinds cool. of cool brainy psychology history type stuff. Cool. Yeah. Uh, well, I'm on uh, Seeker still, where I've been for quite a while now, still making uh, little videos. In fact, if you tune in, you'll see that bookshelf, but like right behind me, that's how they <laughs> like it. 
And uh, I also work for NVIDIA's YouTube channel, uh, GeForce. So when there will be video game events again, I'll be interviewing developers on there. And then I stream on Twitch. Uh, I'm going to be doing that at 6 o'clock today. I do Monday, Tuesday, Thursday, Friday. Uh, the channel and all my socials is Hug It Out. So nobody can say Huget correctly. So it's <laughs> H-U-G-G-E-T, out, Hug It Out. And uh, speaking of facial expressions, I just learned when I play a first-person shooter and I'm shooting at somebody, I do this. <laughs> I, I can't help myself. I'm so dialed in. I'm like, oh god, that's my face when I'm shooting. I didn't know. That's really funny. So yeah, if you want to hang out live, like kind of like we're doing here, and chat with me, Twitch.tv/slash Hug It Out. Do you still build Lego on your streams as well? I do. Because I do. that's my you favorite. See, oh my god, it's I've so got fun. the I've got the Saturn Five, and I've got Apollo Eleven here, and the and this Bugatti, and I built those all live on stream, and that's I'm seriously Lego? going. Yeah, the Bugatti yeah. one, Ali. Oh my God, it's so cool. It's really heavy. There's a mo. There's actually like pistons and like a gearbox. Wow. That thing is awesome. It's this awesome. Thing, it was three thousand six hundred pieces, and it has a working eight-speed gearbox with paddle wow. shifters inside. Yeah, it's, it's so cool. It's so so yeah. so cool. And you can actually see when you roll it, depending on the gear, you can see the engine moves at different speeds based on how fast. It's it moves. really amazing. That's I want cool. that set so, so bad. Oh, it's, it's I've, I've got, uh, I can tilt up. I've got the Hogwarts castle there. Ah, I see it. Um, I have to buy the light kit that they make for it. And then oh, I yeah. have the Saturn V here in my old apartment, but it doesn't really fit in this one, so I have to figure out a place. Then I have a Volkswagen Beetle there. And I was just at my parents' house recently, Julian, and you'll appreciate this. They have all my Lego from growing up. So I have a pirate ship, two castles, a non-pirate ship, uh, and then like a whole, like a monorail, a, a train that had, was a motorized train. I have so many sets and I just have to like find a way to get them from Michigan to <laughs> California. When my parents moved to Barcelona, they gave away all my Lego sets and they were, and I was like, <laughs> I'm probably outgrown them anyway. And then it turns out I haven't. No, 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 no. <laughs> Okay. Well, I think we'll wrap it up there. Uh, it seems like a good thing to spend your time doing Lego is, is always super fun. They did not sponsor this in any way, but we really enjoy apparently Lego and Animal Crossing and a bunch of other <laughs> stuff. Um, thank you guys for joining. This was so fun. It was nice Thanks to just see your faces it. and like talk about stuff. A pleasure. Really nice. Yeah. Talking with real science people who know stuff so I can just learn. I just repeat <laughs> what I hear. I don't do any research. I don't know anything. Thank you. So th Thanks, everybody. Um, you can find me, obviously, on this channel or Trace Dominguez anywhere on the Twitters, the Instagrams, you name it, I'm out there. Um, and I have a video coming out, hopefully on Monday, if I can edit all weekend and get it done, uh, about what asymptomatic actually means and why it is that we're talking about it so much and why it's so important for us to know who is asymptomatic and who isn't and why. It should be really fun. I'm excited. And hopefully it'll be featuring a special guest. Depends if she is too busy to hang out with me or not. I don't know. We'll see. <laughs>